Um, so uh, a little embarrassing, uh, the first part of my deck actually uh, repeats a lot of what James said, uh, which totally was not on purpose. Um, but uh, it's actually really good because uh, uh, what I dive into in the second half actually builds on a lot of what he's saying and goes into sort of that next level of detail. Um, and so a lot of what I'm talking about is not just about viral experiments, but we use this foundation for everything that we do on the growth team at HubSpot, um, not just virality experiments on some of our new products, but content experiments, Facebook ads experiments, things that we work on with retention, everything that we do. Um, so uh, similar to James, the, the number one question I am always asked about growth is what tactic would you use to grow my company? And when I get asked that question, uh, my initial response is, I've got no clue. Um, I just met you. I know nothing about your company. I know nothing about your audience. I know nothing about your product. And typically, the reason I get this question is because it comes from a sense of they're looking for one tip, one secret, one hack, one tactic to unlock this explosion of growth in their business. And Unfortunately, uh, my answer to what tactic would you use uh, to grow the company is not what most people think it is. It has nothing to do with tactics, and it has everything to do with process. And when I mention the word process to most entrepreneurs, their eyes roll back in their heads or they glaze over and they're like, man, I don't want to even listen to you. But uh, what I want to dive into is first is four reasons to focus on process before tactics. And the first reason is a lot of what James says, what works for others is not going to work for you. Your product, your audience is different, your product is different, your business model is different, your customer journey is different. Bottom line, your business is different, plain and simple. And you need a method, you need a way, you need a process to find basically the combination of things, that unique combination of things that is gonna work for you, not somebody else. And so as you listen to a lot of the tactics today uh, at a lot of the great speakers, something I encourage you to do is take a mindset of using that as inspiration or as input to this process and not necessarily prescription. But the second reason to focus on process before tactics is that growth in a lot of cases ends up being the sum of a lot of small parts. I'm sure a lot of us every week are probably reading TechCrunch, VentureBeat, one of these tech uh, publications, and we see some company with some growth curve like this, and all of us are sitting there and wondering, what happened there? What happened right before this exponential curve just took off? But the real questions we should be asking and digging into is, what are all the little things that they did to get to that point, that aggregated to get to them to that explosion of growth? And then what are all the little things that they did afterwards to continue to accelerate and keep that growth curve going? Because at the end of the day, as James said, silver bullets don't exist. Um, you will certainly have experiments and tactics that you do that will end up being outliers, but chasing silver bullets is kind of like chasing unicorns. It's kind of a waste of your time. You want to be aggressive, um, but, there, but remember at the end of the day, it's not going to be one thing that's going to change the growth curve of your business. The third reason to focus on process before tactics is that the rate of change is accelerating. And so if you look at the past year, 18 months, even a shorter time frame, we can pick any acquisition channel and we can probably name, about how, we can name multiple reasons about how the foundation of those channels is changing. SEO, they're taking away keyword data. Uh, they've uh, uh, basically introducing author rank into their algorithm. They're introducing content freshness, social sharing. They're massively, Google's massively changing the search result format. Display continues to be disrupted by RTB. Uh, browsers are taking away cookies, and of course, oh, there's this whole mobile thing that's completely changing the game. Email, Google is experimenting with emphasizing unsubscribe buttons, tabbed inboxes, inbox actions. Of course, mobile changes the format. We can go through any one of these channels, and we can probably name foundational changes in the past six months. More than that, and of course, I've got a, uh, um, a slide from uh, a, a deck that I saw James, uh, or a presentation I saw James give a while back, is that the number of acquisition channels, not just in, um, uh, not just in virality, but paid acquisition, they come and go. And more and more are becoming available to us over time. But the point is, is that things are constantly changing, and so you need to be constantly changing, and you need a, need a way to constantly be finding the new things 
uh, that are going to continue to accelerate the growth of your business. And the fourth reason about process first uh, before tactics is that what you're really trying to go for is you want to build a machine. And a machine, to me, is something that's scalable, somewhat predictable, and definitely repeatable. And so if you think about this in the framework of a machine, the machine produces the tactics. The tactics are the output. So what makes the machine? What, what are the inputs to the machine? And that's the process that you drive um, to basically find and discover and test all of these tactics. So uh, let's jump into the process. Um, the goals of this process, there's really four primary goals that we try to achieve with this process at HubSpot. The first is rhythm. So James talked about a lot about how you have to be able to sustain fa failure. Well, momentum is a very powerful thing. And so you want to establish a never-ending uh, regular cadence of experimentation to basically fight through the failures to find the successes and really find that momentum that keeps, you, keeps carrying you forward. The second, and then probably the most important, is learning, continuous learning. Basically, that constant learning of your customer, your product, and your channels, and feeding that learning back into the process to continue to build off of that base of knowledge is what's going to continue to drive you forward finding uh, the successful experiments and the successful tactics. And the third and the fourth, if you're building out a growth team with multiple people, I believe these two things are really important, autonomy and accountability. And so, um, as you'll see, individuals on the growth team get to decide what they work on to achieve the team goals that we set. Um, so I'm not providing, as, as the team leader, I'm not providing a very specific set of directions. But with autonomy comes accountability. And so uh, um, uh, people on the growth team, they don't have to be right all the time. Their experiments don't always have to be successful. But there's an expectation that they improve over time in terms of their knowledge of the customer product and channels, and that we continue to find more and more successful experiments as we build off of this base of knowledge. So before we dive into what we do on a day-to-day -day and a week-to-week -week basis, we first need to understand where we're going. And so the framework we use to set goals uh, on the growth team is something that probably a lot of you are familiar with. It's called the OKR framework. It was invented by Intel, popularized by Google, used at Zynga and many of the other uh, high growth companies here. And what OKR stands for is objective and key results. I'm not going to dive into details here, but how we set these goals is basically we first we take a step back and we ask the question, what is the one area that we can work on or the one thing that we can achieve that drives the biggest impact on our growth curve right now? Um, and taking this step back and really understanding this question before we actually dive into the individual experiments is really important. So we figure that out. We then set a time frame. It's always 30 to 90 days. Anything shorter than 30 days, we're probably not uh, being aggressive enough and big enough with what we're trying to achieve. Anything longer than 90 days, we're probably biting off too big of a chunk. Um, and so we always try to basically set this objective to something that we feel like we can reasonably make significant progress on in 30 to 90 days. And then we set three key results. These are quantitative measurements of what tell us, you know, give us evidence that we basically achieved this objective. And the KRs are set, the key results are set basically uh, in order of difficulty. And so KR1 is basically like, hey, we did a good job. This isn't sandbagging it. This is basically, we did a really good job. We tend to hit our K1, or we, we try to set these goals so that we hit our KR1s about 90% of the time. KR2s are like, okay, we went above and beyond and we did a really great job with this. We hit those about 50% of the time. And our KR3s are like, man, we, we knocked this thing out of the park, right? Let's go like, to Vegas and celebrate, right? Um, and we, we try to set these so that we only hit these about, you know, about once a year. If we're hitting our KR3s more than once a year, then we know that we're not setting goals aggressively enough. And if we're not hitting our KR1s ever, then uh, that, then basically we're probably setting it too aggressive. So finding the sort of that happy medium. So after we tour, sort of take this step back and, and really think about what is the most impactful thing that we can do and basically set some goals against it, we really try to dive into this 30 to 90 day period at, as fast as we possibly can. Um, and so this is where kind of the day to day and the week to week process comes. So first I'm gonna basically give you a high level of the things that we walk through then we're going to dive into each step, and then we're going to take a step back out and talk about 
how we look at this thing from more of a macro level. So the steps, the, the constant steps in the cycle that we go through after we set these OKRs is first is we brainstorm, uh, then we'll prioritize, then we'll design tests around the things that we prioritize, we'll go and implement those tests, we analyze those tests, and then we take the success, successful ones and systemize them. And then we also take that analysis and those learnings and we feed them back into the process. So let's dive into each one of these individually. Um, and so along this process, there's really four key documents that we keep uh, that really help us drive this process. The first is a backlog. This is just a place for us to dump all of the ideas that we have in the growth. Anybody on the team, it's fully public. Um, anybody can contribute ideas to the backlog. And the main purpose of the backlog is to provide us an area, an outlet basically, for us to dump our ideas as we go along in this experimentation cycle. Uh, we're gonna find a bunch of new ideas, and instead of trying to like remember those ideas and keep them in our head, or uh, we basically provide an outlook to basically empty our headspace and make sure that we've recorded the ideas that we can come back to later. The second is the pipeline. This is basically a ledger of experiments. It's all of the experiments that we've ran previously, as well as the ones that are currently running and the ones that are on deck. Uh, and so, um, and of course, the highlights of their results. And so this pipeline is, uh, is used, you know, when, when somebody starts on our team, they can literally go to this pipeline and see, you know, from day one, what, are, what is every single experiment that we ran through to get to where we are today? The third document is our experiment docs. Uh, so every experiment gets one of these, and this is probably the most important document out of the four. And this experiment doc basically uh, forces us to think through the important elements uh, such as why we're doing this experiment versus others, what we expect from this experiment, how we're going to design this experiment and implement it successfully, and then of course record those learnings that are so important to the entire process. And we'll, we'll take a look at one specifically. And the fourth is playbooks. So basically anything that we find that's successful, we first try to productize it with software and engineering. Um, but if it's something that's done more manually, like uh, we find a way to, uh, that works really well to promote a piece of content, we'll systemize these into playbooks. And these are just basically step-by-step -step guides uh, for things that we want to repeat over and over and over. All of these documents, uh, we personally use Google Docs for this so that we can share it with the entire team. Uh, we can comment, we can collaborate. Um, they're fully public to everybody. Anybody can go in and read them at any time. Um, the actual tools that you use to do this aren't uh, as important as just basically getting to, into this process. So this first step, brainstorming. So the first thing that I wanna get across when coming up with the growth ideas is that you wanna brainstorm on the inputs, not the outputs. So if our OKR is basically set at improving some sort of activation rate, we're not gonna sit there and say, how can we improve activation rate? Because the reality is, is that whatever you're trying to improve, there's probably a thousand different ways to improve it. And so when you sit there and try to think about this thing that can be improved in a thousand different ways, it's really, really hard to come up with a bunch of growth ideas. So the first thing that we do is we break this thing down into pieces, as small of pieces as we possibly can. So in a really simplistic example, right, this product uh, has an activation or onboarding flow that has three steps, right? We would basically break it down into three steps and then we would go through each step systematically and brainstorm ideas around each one of those steps. And so narrowing, basically narrowing the scope of our brainstorm to each one of these steps makes it much, much easier to come up with more specific ideas about how we can uh, basically improve these inputs which will lead to an improved output. And so there's really four ways uh, that we use to generate growth ideas. And um, to be honest, I blatantly stole this from a book called The Innovator's Solution. I recommend everybody to read it. But the four ways, uh, the first is observe. So we do uh, look at how others are doing it, both in our competitive space and non-competitive space. So we'll do an exercise basically, uh, you know, basically one of the last things we worked on was optimizing our referral flow. Uh, we sat down as a group for 20 minutes Everybody on the team picked two or three products that they use on an active basis, and we walked through as a group, basically their referral, uh, their referral flow and talked about what are the things that they do well, what are the things that we notice, what are the things that we could have done better, and out of that process ends up generating a ton of ideas for us. 
But whenever we go through these exercises, I just want to reiterate my point is that we always take these things as inspiration, not prescription. And so we're always looking for ways to adapt what others are doing uh, specifically to our product and to our audience. The second thing that we do is we do a lot of questioning. And so one specific exercise in this category is that is we do something called a question brainstorm. And what that is is about an hour meeting. Basically, the first 15 to 20 minutes, what we do is we ask nothing but questions. There's no discussion. There's no answers. Uh, we basically just write down questions on little post-it notes. We announce what the question is and we put it on the board. And we try to ask as many questions as we possibly can within that given time period. Anything from the whys, the what is, the what ifs, the what about, um, everything about our audience, the specific OKR that we're setting. And what this does is two things. It basically reveals the things that we don't know. And the second is typically any good answer starts with a good question. And so these questions basically give us a pipeline for uh, our PMs or our data scientists to start really digging into. And as we learn some of the answers to these questions, a ton of ideas on how we can play off of those answers tend to pop out uh, of that process. The third thing we do is we associate. Um, and so there's uh, a technique called smashing. You basically take what you're trying to improve and smash it with something that's completely unrelated. Uh, so one of the audiences for one of our new products is basically salespeople. So something that we did is we looked uh, and we asked the question, what if our activation process was like closing a deal? The thing that salespeople, our audience, finds as, as the most exciting thing. What would the language look like? What type of language would we be using if it was like closing a deal? What type of emotions do they feel that we try to evoke during this process? Um, and how can we bring out all of those elements that you know, most people would think would be completely unrelated, um, but in our activation flow. And then the fourth is network, which I think, I, and I hope that most of you are here today, is that uh, um, it's just finding a good network of other growth people. I'm on the phone probably almost every day with a lot of the people who are gonna be here at this conference today, uh, exchanging ideas, talking about the things that we're trying, what worked, what didn't work, why we think we didn't work, and, we, and I take a lot of those ideas and we feed them into this process and adapt them and use it as inspiration. Uh, and so out of all of these exercises, the, these brainstorms, we don't do every single one for every set of OKRs. We pick one or two. Um, we end up with uh, basically this backlog. And basically, once again, it's just a list of ideas, um, where they are in the process, what category they're associated with. And then we'll talk about some of these things on the right-hand side in terms of the prediction and the resource estimates soon. And so after we brainstorm, the biggest thing is that we need to prioritize. And so as humans, uh, we tend to do a few things. We uh, tend, uh, before we dive into an idea, we tend to overestimate the probability of success. After we implement things, we probably inflate the impact of that success. And we also underestimate the amount of work it's going to take to actually test and implement this thing. And so it's really important to find a way and force yourself to be brutally honest uh, on these three elements. And so we look at our top ideas in the backlog, and we always compare them on three uh, components. The probability that we think it's going to be successful, the impact that it will have if successful, and the resources required to test and implement. Uh, the first and the third, we do it very quickly. Probability, we just give a low, medium, or high. Something that has a high probability of success is typically based off of a previous experiment where we learned something very concrete and now we've, we've got an idea on an iteration of that based on our learnings. Something low is probably like we're venturing into brand new territory, uh, a new channel or something that we know nothing about. Um, and resources, just rough estimation on marketing, design, and engineering, one hour, half day, one day, one week. The impact is probably the most important one out of these three. And it's probably one that most people miss. And so every single experiment idea, everybody has to come up with a hypothesis, which pretty much comes down to this formula. If successful, this variable that we're trying to target will increase by this much because of these assumptions. And this format is really, really key. We're basically making a prediction of what we think is going to happen and is revealing the assumptions that we're making behind that prediction. And most people look at this and say, well, man, I have no idea how this is going to work. And that's the point, is to actually think through of like why we think this is actually a good idea and why we think it's going to work. And there tends to be more data to make this prediction than most people think. 
And so the three places that we look to justify our assumptions are quantitative, qualitative, and secondary data. Quantitative data we typically get from all of the data collection around our product. Um, we'll look at a lot of previous experiments and sort of the data of those uh, and what's released. So um, a really simple example would be uh, if we found basically that uh, testimonials uh, helped us increase the conversion on our invite page, we might look for other places in the product for us to use testimonials to increase the page of, of that. And we, can, and we know what the, the percentage uplift that that testimonial had on that invite page, and we can make some sort of analogy or some sort of parallel or comparison of what percentage of uplift we expect on those other pieces of the product. The second is, of course, qualitative. So surveys, support emails, user testing, different recordings. Uh, we use those, you know, if we, if we can start to detect patterns coming out of this qualitative data, that's enough to justify and help us justify one of our assumptions. And of course, is secondary, networking blogs, competitor observation, uh, anything that I get from uh, sort of my growth network. Uh, if they tell me they saw this sort of lift, um, it's at least a data point to give us some sort of indication rather than pulling things um, out of thin air. And so we always try to prioritize it, once again, against these three things. And a lot of times, um, if, you know, if we're weighing between things that have very, you know, a few things that have very high probability of success, lower impact, but very low on resources, I would rather crank those things out than take, uh, basically work on something that has really low probability, potentially very high impact, and, but very intensive resource-wise. I'll do the low, we'll do the low resource intensive things first before we do the high intensive resource things um, because uh, the more experiments you get in, the more successful ones you get in, the faster your growth curve, uh, it sort of builds on itself. Um, and so we take these assumptions and this hypothesis and we put it in the experiment doc. And this is where we start to create the experiment doc. So first it's just the objective, we state what we're trying to do, our hypothesis in that format, and then we list out the assumptions. Um, and these numbers are made up, so if they don't add up, I, I apologize. Um, but basically now, uh, basically we can sit down and we can say, and we can weigh this against all, all the, the other experiments in our pipeline comparatively and, and say, well, uh, what do we expect out of this one compared to this one? How do we feel about these assumptions? It allows other people on the team, allows me to challenge the person's assumptions and hopefully get more and more accurate over time. And so once we have these things prioritized, what we do is we try to design a minimum viable test. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the minimum viable product. This is the same thing except it's the minimum thing we can do to understand or get data around our hypothesis. And a very simple example of this is uh, when we are optimizing our referral, uh, our referral and our invite flow, basically one of our products we give away a month free for every person you invite. We wanted to test basically what would happen if we gave away two months or three months free for every person to invite, or what if we went in the opposite direction and we only gave one month free for two or three people to invite. And instead of imp implementing this whole system um, code-wise and, and the accounting behind that system, all we did was we changed the landing page and the language around it, and we looked to see how behavior changed. Um, that took us maybe two hours compared to days of engineering resources it would take to uh, basically fully implement it. Um, and so as we think about this minimum viable test, we'll outline the minimum viable test in the experiment doc. And so this is an example of a very simple homepage experiment where we're testing three different themes uh, with a couple variations per theme. And this experiment uh, is, uh, the outline of the experiment is meant to be so that if anybody else wants to go back and is looking at this experiment and trying to understand the learnings or possibly repeat it or iterate off the experiment, they pretty much can repeat that experiment without having to talk to you within a certain degree. It's, it's not super detailed, it shouldn't take you that long, but it's used to basically, uh, for that purpose, as well as forcing you to think about the experiment beforehand and what you need to do to basically get a valid result. The number of times I've been through where we dive into an experiment, we run the experiment, we get the results, and then we're like, oh crap, we forgot to control for this one variable, and then we have to go back through the whole process again. That, happened, that used to happen a lot before we implemented this, and so just taking the five minutes to think about this beforehand really helps with that. And then of course, step four, after you get the minimum viable test and it's in the pipeline, you implement it, I don't need to talk about it, you just get shit done, do it as fast as possible. 
But after the experiment is done and after done, we go through the analysis. And this is probably the most important step. And so we look at three things when we analyze the success or failure of an experiment. We look at the impact, so basically what were the results of the experiment, the accuracy, how close we were to the hypothesis, and most importantly, why. Why did it succeed or why did it fail? Why were we close or way off of our, uh, of, of our hypothesis? Digging into the question why will help you once again go back and start understanding things about your customer, your channel, and your product and will lead to basically iterations and new ideas of, uh, of the experiments that you should probably run next. If you don't ask this question why, and you just blindly move on to more experiments, you're just blindly running experiments. Um, you're not actually basically taking the learnings and building and working towards something that's more successful. And so when we go through this analysis, so this is all the homepage variations, we look at, um, every step of the funnel, so the views, the click-through rate, the conversion to registrations, the activation rate, and then basically the end ratio. And we look at that, and so um, we'll look at this experiment, and we'll basically take uh, the learnings, basically what were the winners, um, uh, the actual experiment when we ran this, what we found were some variations were uh, activating people much better um, than others, uh, and so we use those elements in the version in the variations that were activating much uh, people much better, and we utilized them. We actually took them off the homepage and we threw them in the activation process, uh, which actually helped the activation process even more. So, anyways, point is extract as many learnings as you can out of every experiment, list the next iterations, the action items, uh, and throw those action items back into the backlog, and take these learnings and go back to your backlog and look at your prioritization of your next ones and, and adjust your predictions based off of your most recent learnings. And then, of course, step six is systemize. So once you find things that are successful, we first, once again, we try to productize them, do as much as you can with technology and engineering. And the second thing is the things that you can't do with technology and engineering, you build into playbooks. And so as you hire and you scale the team, you have these playbooks that you can just point people to. Uh, and they can basically repeat these things with uh, pretty much uh, minimal effort. You've sort of uh, retained all of that knowledge that you've built up and learned through all of these experiments. And so this, you do this over and over and over again as many times as you possibly can within this 30 to 90 day period of OKRs. You take all of this analysis, all these learnings, constantly feed it back into the backlog, constantly refine your predictions so that you keep building it off of this base of knowledge. And so what a typical week looks like for one of our teams is that on Monday we have a 60 to 90 minute meeting. It is the only meeting we have all week. The things that we go through is we start the meeting off with personal learnings. Every single person states one thing that they learned about our customer product or channel last week. If everybody's not learning at least one thing, then something's seriously wrong. We'll then review our OKRs, our progress against them. And if we're not uh, on track, then we will, uh, we will talk about how we can get back on track. And then we go through the experiments. We pick out the key experiments that led to the most analysis, and the people who own those experiments basically talk about what they learned, they share the learnings. And then based off of those shared learnings, we talk about what are the experiments that we're gonna start to implement this week. The rest of the week is dedicated to the other steps. We predict, prioritize, implement, analyze, systemize, and we constantly try to repeat that cycle as much as possible. And so we get in this cycle of constantly zooming out, once again, setting those OKRs, thinking about what is the most impactful thing that we can possibly do, zoom in, run as many experimentation cycles as we possibly can, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. And so this process helps you, instead of constantly having to stop and think about, am I working on the right things? You take that time in the zoom out phase to think about that thing, and then in that 30 to 90 day period, you're just basically, you're cranking through this experimentation cycle as fast as possible. And so after you go through a few of these cycles, we'll take a step back, we'll look at the macro optimization, and we'll look at three things. We'll look at our batting average, so how many successes to failures, and are we improving over time? Uh, the second thing is accuracy, so are our hypothesis getting more and more accurate, especially in channels that we've got the most history. So the more you work in a channel, the more accurate you should probably get. And then the third is throughput. So how many experiments are you running in a given period of time, and how can you do more? And you can typically optimize this, these things in three ways. You can get better with the process, you can get better with the team, or you can get better with your tools and instrumentation. Uh, and so we'll probably do this on a quarterly basis, um, or maybe once every four months. 
And uh, that way we're constantly tweaking and optimizing this process. Uh, and that's it. Thank you.